49 in the word of the Lord tonight. <clears throat> Praise God. Genesis 49. Praise God. Christine, isn't that, is that conference, ladies conference, this starting Friday night? Okay. Genesis 49, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together, and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel, your father. And uh, that's pretty much as far as we need to read, as far as having you stand. So you may be seated right now. This term here, last days, in the Old Testament... You're going to find a reference to it as far as the first five books of the Bible. You're going to find a reference to it here in this chapter 49. And then chapter, go to Deuteronomy. Let's see there. Deuteronomy also written by Moses. Dealing with the sons of Jacob. You will see in Deuteronomy 32 and 33, again, prophecies that will deal with the sons of Jacob. Okay, in verse 7 it says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. As thy father, he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. These are last day passages, okay? Now, another passage in the book of Numbers dealing with Balaam and Balak. Are y'all familiar with them? Okay, remember Balaam was hired by Balak to go and curse the nation of Israel. That incident, those chapters are also last day prophetic scriptures in the five books of Moses. All right, so y'all want to be sure and keep these together because they're very powerful. Now, so the Bible says that Jacob calls his sons. He's about to die. He's 147 years old. He gathers them before him, and he's going to begin to bless them. But he's really going to speak prophetically over them. This, again, I will tell you again, is vast. It's so vast that there's no way that we can cover this in one night, probably not two nights. It would take us... I would say 12 weeks of study to get through this. Really, you'd have to go through the whole Bible. It's vast, all right? But we're going to try to just go as, you know, the way God would have us, anoint us, and look at this. I don't know how far we're going to get into this tonight. We may finish it. We may not finish it, okay? But it's very, very awesome. It lays the pattern out for prophecy. It lays out the pattern for the nation of Israel historically. It lays out the pattern of... Your experience in God. So that's pretty vast. Say, so if it covers prophecy and it covers the nation's history and it covers your conversion, that's pretty much your Bible. And I'm going to let Brother Eloy come up here and explain it all to you. Because he'll probably do a better job than I will. <laughs> now, but watch this. Verse 3 Reuben, thou art my firstborn. Reuben is Jacob's firstborn, so he's got the what? Or he had the what? The birthright. Which means he is the one, if he would have kept his nose clean, who would have been the king and the priest, or his descendants would have been. But he messed up. And in Genesis 35, he went into, into Belha, Belha, his father's concubine, and had a sexual relationship with her and disqualified himself from the birthright. God stripped him from it. Now, Reuben repented of that sin. He went before God and he confessed what he did was wrong. Okay? He got restored as far as relationship goes. But he lost his right to be a leader in the house. See, there are things that you and I can do. We can come to God to confess and get right, repent of that, and get restored in our relationship and in our fellowship with God. 
but that mistake will disqualify us from any leadership in the house of God. So you want to be very careful, and I want to be very careful about how I handle my life. Because there's some things that I can do that will not destroy my soul if I repent, but they will affect my leadership or disqualify me from leadership of having any part in the future of, of a ministry. So it's very dangerous. And so Reuben was stripped of his birthright, could not be a king, could not be a priest. Nobody from his tribe will ever be a priest. Nobody from his family will ever be a king. He had all of that and he threw it all away for a temporary fleshly gratif gratification. The scripture tells us about Reuben. He says, Reuben, you're my firstborn. You're my might. See, at one point, you were my king. You're my might. And the beginning of my strength. You can flip these around possibly. The might could represent the priest. And the strength can represent the king. But what he's saying is this. When you were firstborn, you had the birthright to be a priest and a king. But you've disqualified yourself from that. Okay? Okay. And he goes on, he says this, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. So again, priesthood and majesty is made reference here. He says, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. So he says, on the one hand, you were excelling in strength. You were excelling in power. You were excelling in might at one point. But then you sinned and you went into my concubine and because of that, you will no longer excel in the future. Okay? Y'all with me here? So he says he's unstable as water. You know, he went in and, and he committed that act of sin. And it's like taking a glass of water and pouring it out on the ground. And you can't retrieve it. There's some things that, like I say, you can get your relationship right with God. But there's some things that sin in your life will disqualify you from and you'll never be able to go back and pick it all back up never go back get the water up that you've spilt and put it back in the glass it's, how many of y'all better gone and picked up water you poured out of a glass can't do it so he's saying to Reuben you're unstable as water you went into that woman and you committed that sin you came out and disqualified yourself you can't get the water again you're unstable Right? You know, water's unstable, right? It just flows. Where does it flow? It flows into the area of least resistance. You know what I'm saying? Whatever's easiest, it flows to. That's the way of the flesh. I mean, it's easy for us to give into the flesh, but it's difficult to walk in the Spirit. It's difficult to be in a place where God can use us. And I say us because water flows to the place of least resistance. And that's the flesh. And so he's unstable as water. You can't depend on him. He's not committed. He's very easily swayed to the things of the flesh. And then when he goes in and does those things of the flesh, he disqualifies himself and he can't change that. Okay? So, man, we need to listen to what God's Word says here. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defiledest thou it. He went up to my couch. Now, if you study the prophet or the uh, prophecy here about Reuben, let's go over to the book of Numbers, and it will tell us that he will not excel. The book of Numbers. In chapter 1, please. And again, this, what is the book of Numbers about? It's the numbering of the people of Israel. Okay? Specifically, the numbering of the soldiers. Now watch this. Verse 21. When we first read about the numbering of the tribe of Reuben... It is those that are numbered of them, even the tribe of Reuben, were forty and six thousand and five hundred. 
So 46,500, right? When we first read about their number. Now go over to Numbers 26 and verse 7. Numbers 26, 7. These are the families of the Reubenites, and they that were numbered of them were 40 and 3,730. So 43,730. So what we've seen here is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Because when you first see him, he's at 46,000, right? 46, 5. Next time I read about him, he's not excelling, but he's decreasing in number. So he's at 43,730. So instead of increasing, he's decreasing. He's not excelling. Mm, I don't want to be him. <laughs> now, this man Reuben settled on the eastern side of Jordan. Remember whenever Israel was making their way to the promised land? The eastern side of Jordan, two and a half tribes wanted that part on the wilderness side. Y'all remember that? Right? Nine and a half tribes cross over Jordan and encamp on the western side of Jordan. But Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh go to Moses and say, Hey, you know what? We kind of like the wilderness side of Jordan. We don't really want to cross over Jordan and go over into that promised land over there. We like the wilderness side because, you know, it looks like it's pretty good cattle country. Pretty good sheep country. So we'll take the wilderness side and uh, y'all can have the promised land. See, they're, they're messed up in their thinking. Reuben was... Again, he didn't excel. He decreased in number, and he stayed on the eastern side of Jordan, sometimes called Transjordan today, stayed over there. Moses said, I'll tell you what, if you and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh will cross over with us and you'll fight with us, then you can have the territory. Okay? So they're really, like I told you before, the Reubenites are pretty much worthless. That's pretty, that's sad, isn't it? I mean, because he had so much potential. He had so much possibility. He was the firstborn son of Jacob. A man who could have been the king or his descendants kings and priests, but he threw it all away because he was disloyal, uncommitted, like water, unstable, and very fleshly. And instead of having that place, high position of authority, he is, instead of increasing to that level, he is descending and camping on the wilderness side of the Jordan. I'm going to ask y'all, how many of y'all are like that? Think about it. I'm not just teaching you. I'm not reading your comic book today. This is reality. See, I can be right with God, saved, but disqualified for ministry. Right? And I can get so fleshy that I like the wilderness side instead of the promised land side where the, the Spirit of God leads me. And, you know, the fleshly side over there, that's kind of where I'm at, okay? So that is the story of Reuben. Now let's go on. The Bible tells us in verse 5 about Simeon and Levi. We touched very briefly about this last week. Simeon and Levi. Say Simeon, Simeon. and Levi. Levi. Now, remember Reuben means what? Behold a son. It's the firstborn son of Jacob to who? To Leah. Good. And when Leah has Reuben, it says, Behold a son. See a son. Then the next son she has, and she has six of them. The next son she has is Simeon, and Simeon means hearing. So Reuben means look, Simeon means hearing. 
And then Levi means joined. That's Leah's third son. And then Judah means praise. That's Leah's fourth son. Y'all with me here? Okay, so we've got Reuben. Behold a son, but he's not living up to what he could have been. Now we got Simeon, and it means hearing. And we've got Levi, which means joined. But they've got some problems. So really what God is showing us here and what Jacob's doing here is says, Reuben, you're disqualified from being the king. Simeon, you're disqualified from being the king. Levi, you're disqualified from being the king. Judah, you're the king. You're the one that Messiah is going to become, come from and Messiah is going to sit on the throne from Judah. He's going to be a descendant of the tribe of Judah and that's the kingly tribe, all right? So why is... Then Simeon and Levi disqualified, it tells us, all right? It says, their brethren, instruments of cruelty are there, are in their habitations. Now, let's go all the way back to Joseph. Because this, this prophecy, this statement is reaching all the way back to Joseph. And the cruelty with which they treated Joseph. Simeon and Levi evidently or like the ringleader in the thing. They want to get rid of Joseph. Okay, so because of their cruelty toward, to their brother, they're disqualified. But then you go a little bit further in history, and they also have another problem. Remember when Shechem violated their sister Dina or Dinah? Then they said, if you get circumcised, then you can marry her. And so they agreed to it. Shechem and the whole, really the city, got circumcised. Now you've got to remember that Shechem is a terrible place. I mean, it's dark. It's despicable. It's a place of idolatry. Y'all remember these things? We talked about them. It's a terrible place. Idolatry there. It's sin city. Okay? And so the people of Shechem say, well, we'll go ahead and get circumcised and we'll get into a relationship here and we, so that Shechem can marry Dina or Dinah. But in their mind, in the mind of Simeon and Levi, they, they're not so much concerned about Shechem getting into a relationship with God. They want to retaliate for what Shechem did to their sister. And so they get circumcised, Shechem does in the city, the men. And then Simeon and Levi lead their brothers into this brutal bloodshed in Shechem. And because of that, Jacob, when he finds out about it, he doesn't want any part with it. He just, he's out of it. And he rebukes them for doing that. Yeah, sure, they wanted to uphold the honor of their sister, but the bloodshed and the way they went about it was cruel. They were bloodthirsty. And Dad stands back and says, don't want anything to do with that. You're my sons and you act like that. Not just Dad, but God looked at that and the Bible says, the way he saw it, that they were cruel in verse 6. He said, Oh, my son, come not thou into their secrets. My soul, excuse me. Oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret. That's where Jacob said, Not getting in that. Shouldn't be doing that. Okay? He's mad about that, right? So the Bible continues, and he says, Unto their assembly, mine honor. Be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. We're talking about both Simeon and Levi. God has cursed them. And He said, I'm going to divide them, and I'm going to scatter them in Israel. So that when Israel goes over in Joshua and they go into the promised land. When the tribes get their own territories, Simeon doesn't get a territory. He doesn't get anything. 
on his own. He's spread out throughout Judah, the territory of Judah. Levi reverses the curse. You with me? Instead of aligning himself with Simeon, he gathers himself to God. And when they're worshiping the idol at Mount Sinai, the question is, who's going to come and stand with God? And Levi runs over there and says, we're with God. And so, okay, Moses says, all right, if you're with God, then I want you to take your sword in your hand, and I want you to kill 3,000 of these people who have been caught up in this idolatry. And I want you to go through the camp, and I want you to wipe them out. Levi gets their swords, and they go through the camp, and they kill 3,000 people. And that was in the institution of the law. And then on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were added to the church. So we had the curse of the law and its judgment. Then we had the reversal of that by the grace of God on Pentecost. But see, because the Levites went in there and stood with God and slew their brethren, God made them the priest of Israel. And so they were divided... You know, Simeon was divided just in the territory of Judah. Levi was divided over all, in 48 cities, over all Israel as the priest of God. Okay? Now, y'all remember a man by the name of Pincus? Or Phineas? Phineas? Remember he's, you know, this Midianite woman goes into the camp of Israel and one of the Israelite men get in a relationship with her take her off into a tent somewhere, you know, and while they're in this illicit relationship, Phineas walks over there with a spear and runs them both through. Pins them to the earth. You know what? God said, because, and by the way, he's a descendant of Levi. And God said, because you did that, you will be a priest, your household will be a priest unto me forever. And he's a descendant of Levi. Okay, so Levi, he started out wrong, he messed up, he can't be king. But because of his turning back to God and loving God with all of his heart, soul, strength, and mind, standing with God against idolatry and against spiritual fornication, because he stood for God. Levi, then God said, you will be my priest. Okay, y'all with me here? Now let's go on. Well, brings us to the next area. The Bible's talking about Judah now. Judah, this is where we left off last week. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. You're going to be the one that is seen coming back from war victorious and everybody is saying look what Judah did look at this awesome victory that Judah did everybody's excited look at Judah here he comes but this is prophetic all right this is talking about the Messiah so I'm at Jesus oh, you with me here Amen. so really what he's saying here is in verse 8 Judah thou art whom thy brethren shall praise this word though praise it's not like I'd walk up to Brother George and I'd say, Brother George, you did a good job, man. I appreciate you. you know, that, that'd be praising Brother George. You know, he cleaned the snow off the sidewalk. Thank you for doing that. You know, I appreciate that. You know, oh, that'd be praise, right? But the word praise here is something that is only done to God. It's worship. It's praise. It's given to God. So when we talk about Judah getting praise, we're talking about Jesus. Because he's God, he's going to be worshipped. So already we're going to start seeing that he's going to come from the line, or come from Judah, the line of Judah. L-I-N-E. Okay? Now watch. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Judah means praise. So praise is going to be praised. No, ultimately, Jesus is going to be praised. Okay? Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. 
He's the line of the tribe of Judah. Amen. See, this is, remember this is prophetic. Now, I know this is prophetic because it's pointing all the way to the last days when Jesus is going to come back not as a dying lamb, but as a lion in war. And everybody that's in opposition to him, he's going to come back and he's going to defeat his enemies. He's going to put his foot on their necks. He's going to destroy the Antichrist. One world government system and everybody that opposes him, he's going to defeat them. See, this is reaching way over in the book of Revelation. Right out of this book, Genesis. Find the book of Revelation way over there. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. They're going to honor you because you're going to be majestic. Well, we, you know, Jesus is the one we bow down to. Right? We're going to bow down to the Lord Jesus. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. First of all, we see that Judah here is like a lion's whelp. It's a lion's cub. Little young lion is the way that Judas first made reference to. Revelation 5, Jesus is called, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay? So a lion's cub, he's seen over here in a cave, and he's already devoured the prey. And he's just sitting over there in the cave, having defeated, destroyed the prey, right? The Bible said he's over there in the, in the cave. Who's going to rouse him up? Who's going to stir him up? Y'all are doing real good tonight. Y'all are listening real good. Judas aligns well from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion. And who shall rouse him up? So we see stages here. We see him as a lion's cub. Then we see him as a powerful lion. Then we see him as an aged lion. Right? God's good, isn't he? Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. What is a scepter? It's that rod of authority. It's, it's the kingly rod. You got that rod? You're the one in charge. It tells us the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Now, I shared with y'all, some of y'all were teaching Sunday school and everything. Y'all weren't here Sunday morning. So very briefly, I'll share this with you. In November the 17th and 18th, right out of the constellation, Leo. Okay? Where it says right here, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor lawgiver from between his feet. The Hebrew word is R-E-G-E-L. Regal. Regal. You with me? In the constellation, Leo, in his arm, there's the brightest star. It's called Regal. And this month, we have seen stars or meteors shooting forth from between the feet of Leo. Which telling you he's getting ready to pounce upon what? That serpent... That serpent is called Hydra. And it's just right there underneath the paws of the lion. And then on the back of the serpent, a little bit waist down, there's this cup full of the wrath of God. And in your lifetime, in the month of November, you have seen come from, this is what's significant, is that the meteorites are shooting forth from between the feet of Leo. This passage is pointing to that constellation. And it's telling you to get your eyes on that constellation and watch what happens from between the feet of the lion. So it could be that, you know, you wonder uh, sometimes why things are happening in the spirit. You feel things 
you can't put your finger on. You go through things, you pray, you seek God, you fast, you don't know what is going on. But I'm going to tell you something. Wouldn't it be interesting that if we are about to leave this earth and the Lord's going to, you know, seven years later, come back and pounce upon Antichrist and destroy him. But God's already given the church a sign. And we're already seeing the meteorites coming forth from between the feet. Now, you know, 15,000 meteorites in one hour's time. And they say next year it's going to be 30,000 meteorites in one hour's time. Coming right from the feet of Leo. He's awesome. So again, let me show you verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Now what does Shiloh mean? Until he whose right it is. And we know it's to rule. All right? So Judah, watch Judah. Because that's where the kings are going to come from. And they're the descendants of Jesus. But it's strange to me that Saul, the first king of Israel, didn't come from Judah. He came from Benjamin. And we had kings in the northern kingdom of Israel that were not of Judah. But he's telling us where Messiah is coming from. The king of kings and lord of lords is not going to come from Benjamin. He's going to come from Judah. Okay? And you're going to have David. That's really God's choice, David. He's that young lion at the first. He gets anointed. You know, he goes through a wilderness experience and Saul's trying to kill him and they take him up and they anoint him. They put him over two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And the other ten are over here, you know, kind of wondering what's going on. David's on the throne. And they're kind of slow about making David king over the whole thing. But it's the praisers that are in tune with God. And they're the ones that anoint David. So he's like the young cub there. But time goes by, and I believe it's... Isn't it interesting that seven years later... Seven years later... Seven years tribulation period. Seven years later, the whole kingdom makes him king. And that's when he becomes not just a cub, but he becomes a lion. And you keep on moving through time. And pretty soon you're going to get to the end of all the kings. And Jesus is going to come and He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Ancient of Days. And He's shallow. He is the one who has the right to rule. He's the last King. When He comes, that's it. He's, that's it. He's the last King. Right? Are y'all following me? I'm just going real slow. Now watch. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. He's going to be a king. But he's also going to be a priest. He's going to be a priest king. It's going to be a royal priesthood. It's not going to be just Levi priest. It's going to be Judah king priest. After the order of Melchizedek. We talked about that. A royal priesthood. Where a priest is a king at the same time. That doesn't happen in Levitical priesthood. So he's going to change the law. He's going to change the order. He's going to be a king. But he's going to be a priest. Awesome. And the Bible said unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Two things going on here. Number one is that when this king priest comes. He's already come once. People are going to gather to him. And they're going to get saved. They're going to get born again. That's me. That's you, right? How many born again people I got in here? 
I mean, you had to be born again to be here tonight. I'll tell you. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So we're going to gather to him. Now look, what you have to understand is that his kingship, his rulership is not going to just be over the 12 tribes. It's going to be over all peoples and nations and kindreds and tongues. <laughs> Revelation 5 talks about the line of the tribe of Judah and it talks about the redeemed of the Lord that are redeemed out of all kindreds, tongues, and people. So all nations are going to call him king. Gentiles are going to come to him. Gentiles are going to be gathered to Jesus. But also in the last days, Isaiah 63 talks about when he comes back to the earth. He is going to tread the wine, pra wine press of the wrath of of God Almighty. And the blood of His enemies are going to be sprinkled up on His garments. He's going to walk on them and their blood's going to fly everywhere. Now, you got to see this. That See, I'm gathering to Him in salvation. But there's coming a time when they're going to gather to Him in judgment. And He's going to tread them in the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. See, there's two sides to Jesus. <laughs> I want to gather to Him in mercy and grace, but He's going to come someday, and a lot of people are going to be gathered to Him, and He's going to judge Him. Okay? Y'all with me? Now watch this. Praise God. Verse 11. Binding His foal unto the vine. Now this is where we really stopped last week. Hallelujah. Binding what? Binding the donkey to the grapevine. Well, number one, it's a picture of the prosperity that's going to take place when He comes. And the blessing when He comes. That people are not going to just tie their old you know, donkey up to a tree somewhere, a mesquite bush somewhere. They're going to tie their donkey up to a vine. The vines are going to be so awesome in growth. Hey, just walk up there and tie their donkeys to a vine. Instead of a weed somewhere, you know. But really, you know, I'm telling you this is vast. Really what it's showing you though is this, that you and I. Because God, and I don't have time to get into all this, get your concordance out, and do your little Bible study. You'll find out that God calls men donkeys. Doesn't that make you feel good? He calls men donkeys. And in the book of Exodus, and as if the Lord allows us to go through the book of Exodus, we're going to see that you would have to Firstborn donkey, you'd have to take that donkey and you'd have to break its neck. I'm up here. I'm up here. You'd ha I, I know I'm boring tonight, but I'm just giving you the word. But you'd have to take, his, you'd have to take that, nut, that firstborn donkey and you'd have to break its neck. You hear its bone popping? If you didn't break its neck, you had to redeem it. And if you redeemed it, it could live. Because God's trying to show you something. You are worthless without redemption. You are no good without salvation. All your, all your worth is just taking up and breaking your neck and throwing you aside. If you don't know God, you're not saved and you're not re redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You are worthless. Come on, somebody. But thanks be to God, I've been redeemed. So I don't have to have my neck broken. I don't have to be judged. Because he paid the price of redemption for me. He died in my place. Notice. But it says something about this foal, this colt of the ass. The firstborn. That it's going to be bound 
to the vine. And the vine in the Word of God, see, this is vast. Number one, can talk about Israel. But let's get into the church here. It's talking about the Holy Ghost. It's talking about donkeys. It's talking about men and women who tied themselves to the Spirit of God who were filled with the Holy Ghost and got rid of their own donkey nature, their own rebellion and their self-will and let the Holy Ghost take over in their life and take control of their lives and tell them what to do. So, and it goes on, it says, He washed his garments in wine. Again, number one, the blood. Yeah, the blood. But, taking it to the last days, to his second coming, because remember this prophecy is reaching way down. It's talking about when he comes back. Read Isaiah 63. When he comes, blood's going to be splattered all over his garments. It's going to be so heavy, it's going to be like water. Just washing his garments. With me? It says also, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Now we know that represents the blood. So I've been washed in the blood. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm a redeemed donkey. But again, if you're on the wrong side of God, when he comes back, he's going to break that donkey's net. He's going to splatter that donkey's blood all over their body. He's going to be bathed in the blood of his enemies. Because he was so loving and so merciful and so gracious. Enough to come into this world and die in your place. That if you reject this so great salvation, the only thing that remains for you and I is to have our necks broke and to have our blood splattered. See, there's, there's a lot more to God than a lot of people want to say. Now his eyes shall be red with wine, his teeth white with milk, his majestic Strength. You know, his eyes are as a flame of fire in the book of Revelation. That when he comes back the second time, he's coming back as judge. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. His eyes are as a flame of fire. Those eyes can penetrate through you. Can penetrate through me. And when he looks at me, and I start coming under conviction, because he's always looking at me. He's looking at me daily. And daily I come into the conviction of God. And in my flesh. Especially in these last days. In my flesh. My flesh wants to run from that presence. Because it's getting more intense in the last days. But if you run from it, you'll be killed. The only thing you can do is run to it. Let him look at you and say, you're right, Lord. You're right. I confess, I repent. What you see in me, it's accurate. It's true. And see, what you need to understand is, Jacob's been prophesying. He's already looked at Reuben and told Reuben all his faults. Said, this is why you can't be a king. Then he's told Levi and he's told Simeon about their shortcomings. And you know, by the time he looks at Judah, Jacob looks at Judah with that prophetic anointing, I think Judah was probably saying, oh, Dad, I don't know what you're going to tell me. But I've already heard what you told my, my other brothers, and it wasn't good. You mind if I leave? Because there's some prophetic anointing in this place, and it's revealing and it's uncovering. And I don't know if I want to be here. But all of a sudden, Jacob starts talking nicely to Judah. Judah, you. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not ab living this. This is reality. Jacob's been pretty harsh up to this point. But then he starts, to, Judah, he gets a smile on his face. Judah goes, Phew. Watch. Judah, thou art he. 
You're him, Judah. Binding his fold into the vine, his ass is cold in the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with the milk. And milk is the pure word of God. So right here, I'm joined to him. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm tied to the vine. I've been redeemed by the blood. I once was a donkey, but my nature has been changed. I've got the Spirit of God in me. I've got a new nature. You sang it tonight about the way some people look at things. Look at it by sight and by feeling, by emotion. But we walk by faith. Faith in the pure milk, the Word, the Holy Word of God. Being filled with the Holy Ghost, the fruit of the vine, washed in the blood. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white. Say white. Okay, so y'all write Isaiah 63 over that. Okay, y'all still with me? I'm giving you some foundation here. Verse 13. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven. Say the haven of the sea. Now this is interesting because Zebulun is the tenth son. Zebulun isn't the the fifth son. You've got Reuben, you've got... Simeon, you've got Levi. Then he talks about Judah. That's the fourth son to Leah. But then all of a sudden he jumps to the tenth son. Zebulun. Because God is awesome. That's why. Y'all are saying, why? Because he's awesome. But listen to me. Because once he comes, once Jesus comes, he's got to start his ministry. And you know where... The majority of his, well, I say his ministry, his life. You know where the majority of his life was spent? In the area of Zebulun. So it's talking about him coming from Judah. So quite supernaturally, God's going to talk about where he's going to be living. That's why he talks about, puts the tenth son right there with the fourth son, Judah. He said, This is where he's coming. He's the king. He's coming from Judah. But Zebulun's going to be the territory of his life. That's where he's going to live. He's going to live. Oh, man. Zebulun shall dwell at the haven. Say the haven. Say a refuge. A refuge. It's, it's where when you got a storm, you know, you need a haven, you need a, ref, you need a refuge, a dock to get to, away from the storm, and these ships are pulling into Zebulon. Sea of Galilee ring any bells to you? And they're pulling in there. They're seen as the haven of rest. Okay? Praise God. Now watch. He shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Sidon. So what? Listen. This territory includes Tyre and Sidon. Y'all remember Tyre and Sidon? What the Greeks call Phoenicia? Lebanon today? It was a part of their territory. They were sea people. They were involved in commerce. They were energetic people. And there's a large Gentile population in Galilee. Read the life of Jesus. Study the life of Jesus. Most of his life was spent right there in Zebulon. Even after he started his ministry, he went into Jewry. Jewry. J-E-W-R-Y. Jewry. When he went to Jewry, Jewry. Let me put it that way. Jewry. Not Jewry. Jewry in the land of the Jews. Whenever they rejected him, you know where he went? Even in his ministry, he walked over back over into Zebulon, into Galilee, and there he found rest, and there he found refuge, and there he found haven. See, Zebulon's big. Now look, one little old verse talks about them, and he's the tenth son. 
Why? Because that's where Christ is going to spend most of his life. And when he gets in some opposition, he's going to go to Zebulon. He's going to find rest. And he's going to... Let's go on. Issachar. Say Issachar. Is a strong ass couched. Oh, interesting. Do you know also that 11 of the 12 disciples came from Zebulun? Only one, Judas Iscariot, came from Judah. All the rest of the disciples came right out of Zebulun. No wonder God says, okay, you got Judah, he's going to come from Judah, but here's where he's going to spend his life. This is where his disciples are going to be. They're energetic. They're going to spread the gospel. Watch. Issachar. Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. Don't sound too good, does it? Issachar is a strong donkey couching between two burdens. That's the prophecy you gave me, Dad? That's all you're going to tell me? Thought she was going to give me this long story. You know? I heard what you told Zebulon, and mine's even shorter than his. But it's really awesome. Now, you'll see it. See, I'm giving you a lot of foundation right now, okay? As we build it, you're going to see some beautiful things. But Issachar, see... Israel was forbidden by God to have horses in Deuteronomy. So you can't have horses. Because if you have horses, then you'll go down to Egypt to get them. You'll look to the world to help you. Instead of trusting in God, you will look to Egypt. And you'll look to the horse. So God forbid His people to have horses. How many of you got horses? You better go sell them. No, we're in New Testament days. It's different. But it, this is a good thing when it says Issachar is strong as an ass couching down between two burdens. That's a good thing because we're talking about redeemed donkeys, of course. They become symbols of royalty. Most Listen, if you were a king, you rode a donkey. Why do you think Jesus came riding in on a donkey into Jerusalem? Because he's presenting himself as a king. Are y'all with me now? So Issachar, you're like a strong ass couched down between two burdens. Number one, Issachar, you are a picture of a separated man of God. You're a picture of a man of God separated and a man of God serving your God. Carrying burdens. Getting up underneath the burden. Carrying a load. Not afraid to labor for God. Not afraid to serve God. Not afraid to be separated to God. Oh man. This is good. There were strong warriors in Issachar. In fact, I think Judah and Benjamin, you'll have to check me on this, but I think Judah and Benjamin were the only ones that had a larger number of soldiers in the army in the host of God. Issachar, they were powerful warriors, soldiers, separated. See, these things encourage me. Now watch this. Then he goes on and he says, oh, I got to keep reading. Thank God, Daddy, you didn't stop there. You gave me a little more prophecy. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant unto tribute. He entered into the rest of God. But yet he served. 
How can you rest and serve at the same time? Because you enter into the rest of God. Which means you realize He's already done everything. All you got to do is find out what He's done and do what He's done instead of doing your own thing. You cease from your own labors and you enter into His rest and you do His thing. Praise the Lord. So simple. That's the hardest thing you'll ever do. He said, because I found the rest, I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to labor. I'm fulfilled. I'm satisfied. I'm a warrior. I'll be a warrior for Him. I'll fight for Him. I'll serve Him. I'll be separated to Him. In one place it says of Issachar, He understood His times. He understood what was going on in the time. What's happening in the Spirit? What's going on in the kingdom? What's the enemy trying to do? What's God doing? He understood the times. He didn't just go through time and through life and you know just let it pass him by, not even understanding what was going on. He was in tune with God. Powerful will your tribes. Now go to verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Now watch this. Dan shall be a serpent by the way and adder in the path. Later on, Dan, you know those banners? Those banners they carried back over here in the Old Testament? <coughs> right there? One was the banner of a lion. One was the banner of an ox. One was the banner of a man. One was the banner of an eagle. Later in history, the banner of Dan was the banner of a serpent. Now watch this. It says of Dan, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horses or the horse heels so that his riders shall fall backwards. It is believed that from the tribe of Dan, the Antichrist will rise because he's like a serpent. So that God is going to allow this to happen. Antichrist to rise in order to judge his people. To bring them to God. Are with me here? <coughs> okay. Let's look at the next verse. Verse 18. Now after Jacob says this about Dan. Dan judging his people. Dan being like an adder in the path about the horse hill so his rider shall fall backwards. Jacob says, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Which means this is going to come a time when a lot of the people of Israel are not, listen, not everybody in Israel is going to be sucked into the live Antichrist. See, Dan was the first tribe to go into idolatry. They gave themselves to idolatry. They set up the golden calves. One of the two golden calves is placed in Dan. Let me give you the verse. 1 Kings 12, 28 and 29. So this tribe was the first one to go into idolatry. <clears throat> it talks about this tribe being like a serpent. In the book of Revelation, when it lists the tribes, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. In fact, in history, they almost just disappear. Hmm, this is interesting. It is believed that some of the descendants of Dan are in Europe today. They're a part of a group called Priori Zion. These people claim to be the descendants of Jesus who they say did not really die. That he really didn't die. He got up out of his tomb and he went over to Europe and he got married to Mary Magdalene and had offspring by her. And many of them claim that a lot of these descendants in Europe are descendants from Dan. Well, I wonder where the Antichrist is going to rise from. A revived Roman Empire. Some people want to say, hey, look, the Antichrist, we can prove that he's a descendant of Jesus. 
I'm giving y'all so much. Y'all look at me like, well, I'm almost through. I'm almost through. Hallelujah. Y'all going to have to pray for me, man. Y'all have to pray. Watch this. And so Jacob says, I waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Uh, there's going to be multitudes of Israelites, Jewish people, that are not going to be sucked into that Antichrist system. They're going to reject the mark of the beast. And they're going to experience the salvation of the Lord. The salvation is Yeshua Lord. They're going to experience Him. Salvation means Yeshua or Jesus. So what he's saying right here, I've waited for thy Yeshua, O Lord. I'm not going to be sucked into to the Antichrist. If he's a descendant of Dan, I'm going to serve salvation, Yeshua. Because I waited for him to come. Now watch this. And now verse 19. We're going to talk about Gad. Gad is a troop. A troop shall overcome him. Look at this. Gad, a troop. Now this is interesting. Because Gad means a troop. So you've got to play on words. You've got troop, troop. You've got Gad, watch. A troop shall overcome. Troop, a troop shall overcome. Gad, a troop shall overcome. Now watch this. At the last, look at this, he shall overcome. A troop is going to overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Is everybody doing okay? Remember Gad was one of the descendants who said, the son of Jacob who said, you know what, I kind of like what Reuben's going to do. Reuben's going to stay on the eastern side of Jordan and, hey, can I? Hey, Moses, can I do that? And then we got a half tribe of Manasseh later on doing the same thing. But Gad and Reuben, two full tribes stay on the eastern side, the wilderness side. And because they do that, they're constantly attacked by Ammon and the Midianites. Constantly. See, they isolate themselves from the church. And when they isolate themselves from the church, then they're attacked by Ammonites and Midianites. Because they're out there on the edge. The Ammonites and the Midianites come out there always attacking. They're, they're a warlike tribe. They're more warlike than any other people. They're always fighting. And they're really nomadic. They float from one place to another place to another place to another place. Always being attacked. Troops coming against them. Y'all doing okay? Watch what it says. But in the last, they're going to overcome. Now let's go to Zephaniah. This is a prophecy about Jordan. What's going to happen in Damascus? God's going to completely wipe them out. Isaiah 17, here in, in uh, Zephaniah 2. Let's go there. Verse 8. Minor prophet. <coughs> Zephaniah Haggai. Okay, what? Well, Zephaniah 2. And we're going to read there in verse 8. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. So there's a prophecy about modern-day Jordan getting completely wiped out, and the people of God possessing their territory. Okay? So we have Gad, a troop, shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Gad sometimes called Gilead, the Gileadites. Gilead. So as you're reading the New Testament, this will help you understand who this is, okay? 
Let's go on. The Bible then talks about the next son. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat. And he shall yield royal dainties. What does Asher mean? It means happy. Who said that? Oh, praise God, you make me happy. <laughs> Asher means happy. It means joy. Right? Praise God. Along with Zebulun, along with Naphtali, Asher, Issachar, Naphtali, and Zebulun are in the northern part of the land of Israel. Again, that's called Galilee of the Gentiles. Okay? Praise God. Which means they include, you got to hear this, it includes Tyre and Sidon. And it tells us that from Asher, watch, happy, say happy. His bread shall be fat and he shall yield royal dainties. In Asher, you've got a large Gentile population. How many ever read about a man, if you read your Bible, read about a man by the name of Hiram, the king of Tyre? He's the one that brought up the cedar, the wood, to help to build the house of David. And then later in history, when Solomon got ready to build the temple, it was Hiram, king of Tyre. Who said, you know what? We'll bring up the cedar for you and the wood for you. And we'll bring royal dainties to you out of Asher because Asher possessed that territory. He was a Gentile ruler, but he was in the territory of Asher. Happy. Give God some praise. Elijah was sustained there. In the area of the Sidonian queen, Jezebel. Jezebel came from Asher, that area of Asher. She was a Sidonian queen. Right? So you know what God does? I love what God does. God sends the prophet Elijah right into her land. In the time of his own famine. And sends her to an old widow woman. And right there in Asher, what does it say about Asher? Read it, please. His bread shall be fat. Right there in Asher, in where a Sidonian godless queen named Jezebel lived, God sent Elijah the prophet, and there Elijah was sustained by that woman by the bread from Asher. So we got the king of Hire, you know. King Hiram of Tyre bringing in wood to build the temple. And then we see Elijah sustained right there in that territory with beautiful bread. Hmm. Y'all remember of another lady in the New Testament by the name of Anna? She was a prophetess in the temple. You know, she got married to somebody and her husband died after seven years of marriage. So you know what she did? She just went over in the temple and started ministering to God with prayers and fasting. And Anna came from Asher. You see what I'm saying? Simeon was there too. Simeon, remember Simeon? Predicted the fall of the nation. But Anna represents the rising of the nation. And it says, Anna, in an instant, walked in there. And she came from Asher. Happy. It's a picture of Israel. And, well, the people of God as a whole being restored in the last days. And the joy and the happiness that's going to be in that place. And then if you read the book of Acts in chapter 27, you'll read about an apostle by the name of Paul who makes his way Asher, and he finds rest for his soul. Give God praise. Thank you, Jesus. So watch this, okay? Y'all with me still? 
Let's go on. After looking at Asher, it says, verse 20, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. Okay? So Naphtali is a picture, he's a picture of like a, a deer that's been trapped. It's been caught. And all of a sudden, that deer escapes from its captors. And it, it takes off and it runs. It's set away. And because of that, they're singing. There's words and rejoicing. And there's some praising going on. Okay. Historically, you will recall in Judges chapter 4 and 5, you'll recall a man by the name of Barak. And I know if you don't remember Barak, you remember Deborah, which means bees. And she's a type of the church. She's a mighty judge. You see, there's no men <laughs> in her day that have enough backbone to fight or to be a judge. So God says, okay, there's no, oh, you wimps. Well, almost, almost, with the exception of Barak. You know, they're, they're Caesarus coming up and fighting them and all this, you know. So God just raises it up. Tepra, a woman judge who's a prophetess. And he raises her up. Come on, y'all with me? And she calls, she sends forth. Just like the deer loosed and sent out. She sends for Barak. Barak, he don't really do this. But Deborah's got such an anointing on her life. All right, Barak, come on, let's go. Me? Yeah, you. But I'm over here in Naphtali. Why don't you go call somebody in Judah or something like that? I'm over here in Naphtali. You know? No. Come on, Barak. I need a captain to go fight against Caesarea. And so Barak does. He gathers this army together. He goes up and, he, and listen. Y'all want, I'll give you the, the area of the Bible, I think. Maybe I can do that. I don't know. Yeah, I gave it to you already. What am I thinking? Judges 4 and 5. Read it sometime. It's really neat. He gets over there, Barak, and he's ready to fight. He don't have a sword. He don't have a shield. His brethren leave him, forsake him. Just in his Naphtali brethren around there. You know, the rest of the nation of Israel, they, they got lukewarm, backslidden, cold, and left him. No sword. No shield. He's caught like a deer in a trap. But the prophecy says about Naphtali, he's a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. And after, after everybody's defected and left him there in the battlefield except for Naphtali, he's surrounded by enemies, no sword, no shield, but God comes in there and supernaturally destroys Caesarea. I mean, they get stuck. I've preached Deborah before to you. They get stuck in the mud and everything else, you know. And God sovereignly just wipes them out. And Naphtali, just like a deer, loose, just jumps out of that trap, being surrounded by all those people, and takes off, and he runs back up to Deborah. And guess what happens? The Bible says the next stage. He giveth goodly words. Praise breaks forth. And Deborah writes the song of Deborah. I mean, that would be awesome enough. You're talking about Old Testament. But what if you go into the New Testament? We, something, we see something even greater. Because Naphtali was the territory of Capernaum. Chorazin and Bethsaida. 
And it is there that Jesus made his headquarters for ministry. And he is the one who took good words to Naphtali. And he preached the gospel to them. I mean, there's a lot in this little passage of scriptures. Now watch. Let's keep going. Man, I'm starting to feel pretty good here. He goes on. And he starts talking about Joseph. Hallelujah. I'm going to try to let y'all out early so y'all go slip and slide. You know, so you can take your time going home. <coughs> I mean, some of y'all going to take you till in the morning anyway. You live in faraway lands. Then he starts talking about Joseph. Okay. Is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, and this is the shepherd, the son of Israel. So now we're talking about Joseph again. And we're looking back at all, everything Joseph's gone through, all of his pain, all of his suffering. But God was there, the mighty God of Jacob was there, upholding in him, strengthening him, sustaining him. The Bible said, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. What does that mean? It's the shepherd. It's the stone that got up underneath Joseph and held him up and kept him going. When he was mistreated, when the arrows were being shot at him, when he was being persecuted, God was there holding him up. Watch though. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee? And by the Almighty, who shall bless thee? Look at this, bless him. That birthright blessing. Who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb, the, the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. Jo- Joseph got a double portion. His two sons got territory. Because he had the birthright, he got a double portion, right? Ultimately, this passage is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom age when the greater Joseph comes back and he blesses not just Israel, but he blesses the whole world. Just like Joseph was a blessing to the world. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to bless the whole world. So that passage is going to be fulfilled. We're talking about last days. Now, what's awesome to me, if you look in Ezekiel sometime in, in chapter 47, verse 13, it tells us that even in the kingdom age, that Joseph is going to have two portions of land. God's going to make sure of it. Verse 27. Benjamin. You know what? I might finish this. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. So Benjamin is what? Wolf. Hallelujah. Benoni, son of my sorrow. No. Benjamin, son of my right hand. Son of my power. Benjamin's a picture of Jesus in his first coming. Benoni, suffering, second coming. Benjamin, power. Picture of the early reign and the latter reign. Outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But I've already preached that to you. Okay? But he says about Benjamin, he's like a wolf. He's quick and he's ferocious. He's a powerful warrior. Now, I hope I'm not just grabbing this out of nowhere and it's not true. I think it, I believe it's true. Read your Bible. But I think that Benjamin could, he could shoot with one hand and right hand and sling a stone with the left hand at the same time. I mean, pew, pew. We're all 
awesome. Warriors. Wolf-like. Powerful. God said that's what they're going to be like. Well, if you look at Ehud, Ehud, y'all remember Ehud? Ehud. Judges chapter 3, Ehud. Read about him sometime. He came from Benjamin. Another king that we're familiar with, Saul, the first king, came from Benjamin. And then we read in the New Testament about another man by the name of Saul who was Saul of Tarsus. And he was like a wolf in nature. Right? Give God praise. Hallelujah. Okay. That's the modern. The modern era. But all that's going to happen prophetically in the future. Everything I just shared with you is going to be fulfilled ultimately in the future. Are y'all with me okay? Y'all all right? But before I get to that, I want to very quickly, because I'm going to finish it. I'm, going to, I'm okay. Hallelujah. You know, y'all, y'all been so quiet. See, y'all haven't given me any of this. See, in case you don't know about anointing, let me tell you about anointing. It flows from here. It goes out there. And it's got to come back from there to here. If it don't, you're never going to see me crazy. Mm -mm. Because you didn't do your part. And I know you're wonderful. I'm not trying to correct your rebuke, but I want you to know you cannot come here and just be beautiful listeners. You got to come in here and you got to create some glory. Because the word is anointed. And when, listen, and when it goes forth, if you sit on it, there's no glory coming back. It's like a pendulum on a clock. It goes out, but it's got to come back. And, and you know that you're a wonderful church and I, I, y'all are wonderful people. Y'all deserve better than me. But I want to tell you this. I'm trying to help you understand your role. That when it moves from here and you get a hold of it. And you move in the Holy Ghost. It, what happens is you're creating glory. And it's like a pendulum that flows from here, goes out there, it comes back. Until pretty soon you got a mighty, a very powerful move of God in the house. So anyway, so y'all don't forget that. Okay. Let me go through some things real quick. How do all these names apply to us? Number one. We're going to talk about Jesus first. Every good thing that was spoken from the mouth of Jacob concerning his sons, every good thing was fulfilled in Jesus. Every one of them. Reuben was his firstborn. Jesus was the firstborn son of God. Y'all with me? It is said of Reuben that he was powerful. He excelled in power, strength, might. So that's Jesus right there. He was the firstborn son of God. All power. All might. King, priest. Melchizedek, priest. Next son is who? Simeon and Levi. Well, it talks about their cruelty. It talks about them being cursed. Well, Jesus became a curse for us. And He was mistreated. He was cruelly treated, treated when they hung Him on a cross. Right? Levi is the priesthood. Again, He's a priest. Are y'all doing okay? Ask me if I am. No. <laughs> Levi. Say Levi. Well, I already told you what that is. He's going to be a priest. Then there's Judah. He's going to be a king. And then after Judah, you got Zebulun. And Zebulun is a hate is a haven. Jesus is my refuge. 
He's the one I flee to when I'm in a storm. When I need to take my boat into his rest, into his haven. I find it only in him. In fact, I'm going to show you something in Romans 5 that comes to my spirit right now. Look at this, Romans 5. Watch this. Verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our, look. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access. Say access. By faith into this grace. Wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What do we get there? Peace. How do we get it? Let me read it. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace. The word access there means the same thing I just told you. That he is a haven. He's a rest. It's a picture of you're going through life. You're in the midst of a storm. You're in a boat. But all of a sudden, you've been on that storm. You've been riding the waves. Romans says we have access by faith. How do I enter into this rest? It's by faith. Amen. And it's a picture of being on this storm, being tossed to and fro on this big old, these big old waves. And all of a sudden, after going through all of that, you move into this water where it's perfectly calm. And you pull your boat right up to a dock. And you, listen, and you throw the rope. This is all in a Greek word from which we get the English word access. And you throw your little rope out of your boat and somebody stands there and pulls the rope, pulls the boat in for you. And the way you enter into that haven of rest is by faith. You're on a storm tonight. But exercise your faith. Move into the still calm waters of God by faith and let Him pull you into the shore. But that's not it. That's not the only thing that word means. We have access by faith. It's a picture of the throne. And who's on the throne? Jesus is on the throne. And there's the doors to the throne room. And all of a sudden... You're standing outside there. You can't get in there. Somebody walks over there, opens the door for you. His name's Jesus. You have access by faith. And it takes you right into the throne room of God. And when you, when you get there, what does the Bible say you get? You get grace and not judgment. You get mercy. But it's by faith. So that's in Zebulun. <coughs> so I'm telling you, the whole Bible's in this. Okay. Now after we've got Gad, what do, who do we have? Yes, the car. <coughs> we got Zebulun. No, I, I know. Look, we're on Zebulun here. Okay. I said Gad. Excuse me. Zebulun, refuge, rest. It's the car. Loyalty and service. So when Jesus came, he was this car. He was loyal in service. He said, I, I do always those things that please the Father. Always. There's not one second of my life that goes by that that second wasn't used to please my Father. It's the car. Say, oh. Uh, Say rest. 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 He is the rest of God. And then we go and we talk about Dan. Dan, the word Dan means judge. The Bible said that God would use Dan to judge the people. He's the judge. I said he is the judge. Give God praise. Y'all believe that? 
All right, then we go to Gad. And the Bible said that a troop would go out to confront him. But in the last, he would overcome the troop. So then what we have pictured here in Gad is the triumph of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He overcame death, hell, and the grave. They went out to confront him, but he rose up victorious. And then we've got Asher. And Asher, happy, joy, because he lives. He is joy. But remember what the Bible tells us we're going to find there in Asher. We're going to find bread. And he is the bread of life. And after Asher, you've got Naphtali. Naphtali is the one that's loosed. He's the deer that's loose and sent forth. And he's got good words. Give God praise. So who is Naphtali then? Jesus. He is the prophet with the word of God. He is the word of God. But in his ministry, he's seen in Naphtali as the prophet of God sent forth to bring good words. And then after Naphtali, then you've got Joseph. And Joseph is a picture of Jesus in the kingdom age. Give God praise. And he's ruling and he's reigning and he's blessing all the nations of the world. And then you've got Benjamin. And he's like that ravenous wolf. He's a picture of Jesus as the warrior. He's a shepherd, but he's a shepherd like David. He's a warrior shepherd. He's like a ravenous wolf. He's quick to the prey. His name Benjamin means the son of my right hand, which means the son of my power. And when he comes back, he's not coming the way he came the first time. He's coming with great glory and power like a mighty warrior. Now, I might as well finish it. So let me talk about, I talked about Jesus, now I'm going to talk about us. <coughs> We're Reuben. First thing you got to do, starting out, you got to start with Jesus again. You always start and you always end with Him. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And God laid out all the names and all the sons and the time of their birth so that you'd have, start with Him and you'd end with Him. You start with him, Reuben. Behold his son. Look at him. First thing you got to do in order to be saved is see him. See the son of God who has come. And then after Reuben, then you've got to have Simeon. After you see him, then you hear the gospel and you believe the gospel. And after you've seen him, and after you've heard the gospel, and you believe the gospel, then you have Levi, which means joined. I've been joined to him by the new birth in union with the Holy Ghost. After I've seen him, and after I have heard him, and after I've been joined to him, then I enter into Judah, and I begin to praise the Lord. And then I move on down to Dan. Dan. And that means that daily I judge myself. I judge myself so that I would not have to be judged. I judge myself. See, we need that. Sometimes we want to get rid of that. We want to go through life where we're never examining ourselves and looking at ourselves and judging ourselves and saying, No, you're wrong here. You're not right here. We always want to go through life feeling like we're on top of everything. But God's Word tells me that I'm experiencing Dan right now. I'm judging myself daily. For what I allow myself to do. What I allow myself to say. What I allow myself to hear. I'm judging myself daily so I would not have to be judged. That's Dan. 
And then we go to Naphtali. And the word Naphtali means wrestling. So I've seen him. I've heard the gospel and I've believed. I've been joined to him. I'm praising him. I'm judging myself. But now I'm wrestling with him in prayer. Oh, hallelujah. How many of y'all want to wrestle with God in prayer? You want to be Naphtali. Because when you start wrestling with Him in prayer, that's when you become free from the enemies that surround us. We're like that deer leaping on the mountaintops that's sent forth in freedom. That's Naphtali. <coughs> Next one is Gad. Gad means what? It means a troop. Well, how does that work in my life? Well, I'm a part of a church. If you don't have a church, you're not in it. You, gotta, you need a church. You need fellow believers. You need a troop. You need people that are in the war. You need people that are fighting. You need people that are for real. People that are on fire. Got to have dad. Got to have a troop. Got to have an army. Got to be a soldier. If you're a soldier, you're going to fight. If you're a soldier, it's going to be dirty sometimes. If you're a soldier, it's going to be rough sometimes. But if you got that in your life, then the next one is Asher. Happy. See, I'm never more happy than when I'm really fighting. Next one's Issachar, which means hire. It means I'm a servant of the Lord. I serve Him. Give God praise. I'm, I serve Him. I'm separated. I'm a strong ass couched down between two burdens. You know why I'm excited about serving Him? Because I found the rest. And because I found the rest, I enjoy serving Him. If you're saved, you serve Him. You don't serve God to get saved, but you get saved to serve Him. Zebulon means dwelling, or it means this, occupy till He comes. I'm going to stay in this. I'm going to occupy till He comes. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be found of Him when He returns. Come on, I'm not going to live for God for a few years and then decide, hey, you know what? Not for me. Go out in the world. I'm going to occupy till He comes. Okay, next thing means uh, Joseph. Oh, y'all know what Joseph means, right? It means adding. So that when He comes, He's not only going to take you up there and save you. He's going to, let's see, you serve me faithfully. You won souls, so here's a soul winner's crown. I'm going to add to your salvation rewards. Because you overcame your flesh. You didn't give in your flesh, so I'm going to give you an incorruptible crown. I'm going to add to your salvation. Give God praise. And there's five crowns. Five crowns He's going to add to you once you get in glory. If you qualify for reward. See, it's awesome. God's not just going to save us, but He's going to reward you for service. And then it ends up with who? Benjamin. And only Christ can be that. Only the Lord Jesus. Now, I know we've got the anointing and the power, but He's the Son of His right hand. He, he is the Son of power. So you start with the Behold the son in Reuben. And you end with Benjamin, the son of power. You start with Jesus and you end with Jesus. And ever along the way, you have to fulfill all these things in your Christian life to be for real, to be ready, and to be rewarded. Now the next five minutes, I'm going to finish. I'm going to tell you I'm going to finish. 
I'm going to lay out for you very quickly the history of the nation of Israel. Can you believe this? That right here in these, these 12 sons and these prophecies laid out the whole history. Number one, Reuben, behold a son. Say, behold a son. This is found in the book of Exodus when Israel is in Egypt. They're in captivity. And the Bible said, God saw them. See, because Israel is his son, Jesus is his son. Israel is called the firstborn son of Yahweh, God. And Jesus is called the firstborn son. Same thing. So in Egyptian bondage, God sees his son in Egypt. And Hosea said, I brought my son out of Egypt. So if you ever get that principle, you understand that Israel is a type of Jesus. If you ever understand that the firstborn son, Jesus, is typified by the nation, the prophets will open up to you. Hallelujah. Y'all ready to go home? I know you. That's okay. Then the next one is Simeon. Simeon means hearing. And the Bible tells me that the Lord heard his son's cry in Egypt when they were in strong bondage. And then the next one was Levi. He was joined to them at Passover when he brought them out of Egypt. Passover, he was joined to them. Then Judah, Exodus 15, when they came up to the Red Sea and God opened up the Red Sea, Miriam got her tambourine and she started playing and dancing before God. So she judahed him. She praised the Lord. And then after Judah is Dan. And God had to judge the nation of Israel because they sat around and murmured and complained and whined and cried. God, we're tired of man us into some, some meat. They murmured against God. They murmured against Moses. They murmured against everything. So God had to damn them. He had to judge them. Well, the next one is Naphtali. Wrestling. In Exodus chapter 17, we see that after they murmured, they had to wrestle with Amalek. And the word wrestling is used in their confrontation with Amalek. They wrestled with Amalek. It's laid out historically, all right? Now watch this. Then the next one is who? Gad. Say troop. They went out and they were confronted by troops. Seven nations from the land of Canaan came out and confronted them but they overcame the seven nations so they fulfilled it historically there all right the next one is Asher and they were rejoicing in the land of promise they were happy because their enemies had been defeated by God the captain of the Lord of hosts went before them then after that we've got Issachar they served him in the land for a while then we've got Zebulun dwelling in the land. Then Joseph added, means added after David. Then God added another king. With me? After David. And there was Solomon. But then you've got two sons left. You've got Joseph and Joseph means adding. Come on. David, then Solomon. Then you've got Benjamin. They experienced a time of power under Solomon. But then they also experienced a time of sorrow because of their apostasy under the same king. So it's all laid out for you very beautifully. God bless you. I love you. And next Wednesday, if the Lord doesn't come back and get us, we may or may not finish Genesis. But that's what... Oh, I'm not through. (laughs) Sorry. Somebody go get my son out of my wife's hands so she'll be happy when I get home. Go get him, please, somebody. Deuteronomy, very quickly. I'm a, now i got to move into the prophetic. Gave you all that foundation. I almost forgot the most important thing. You know, if I didn't have God, I'd, I'd lose everything, man. Mind, body, spirit, home, health. What's this. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32. Actually, 33, okay? Very quickly, I promise. I promise. 
Hallelujah. Okay, y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? His numbers. Deuteronomy. Okay, 33. Praise God. All right, verse 6. Let Reuben live and not die, said Moses. I know he's going to decrease. I know he's not going to exhale. But let him live and not die. That means that in the future, Reuben's going to repent. It's a picture of the nation of Israel repenting in the last days. Last day repentance. Okay. Let's go. I'll just go on now. Verse 7. And this is the blessing of Judah. The voice of Judah. And bring him unto his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him. And be thou and help to him from his enemies. So in the last days, God's going to defeat all the enemies of the nation of Israel. When Armageddon, when Armageddon takes place, God's going to come back. He's going to split the clouds of glory. And he's going to defeat the enemies of God's people. And then verses 8 through 11 deals with the restoration of the temple concerning Levi. There's going to be a rebuilt temple. This is all laid out in the future in Levi. Y'all with me? Y'all read it for yourself. I don't have time. Hallelujah. I'm on. Let's look at verse 12. And of Benjamin, he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. Which means not only is Judah going to be safe from his enemies in the future, but Benjamin's going to be safe from his enemies in the future. The awesome thing about Judah and Benjamin is this, is that they were the southern kingdom. And Judah and Benjamin controlled Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in their two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and the temple was in the tribe of Benjamin's territory. God said, I'm going to take care of both of them. I'm going to take care of Judah. I'm going to protect him from my wrath. I'm going to protect him from my enemies. And Benjamin also will be protected. Because he's the son of my power. Manifestation of my power. Are y'all doing okay? Okay, Joseph. And of Joseph, he said, Blessed the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep, the couches beneath. We've already covered some of this. But again, this is talking about the Lord's return. And after he returns, he blesses the whole world in the kingdom age. Okay, let me... Verse 18. And of Zebulun, he said, in this verse 18... Rejoice, Zebulon, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. So now we see Israel in the kingdom age rejoicing and resting in God. And you do realize that the kingdom age is the seventh day. It's the seventh millennium. And the seventh day is what? The Sabbath. It's the rest of God. Only You can only experience the rest of God by entering into His salvation. So we see them in the kingdom age, in the seventh day, in the Sabbath, in the kingdom age, the millennial kingdom of God, resting and rejoicing in God. And then we go to verse 20 and of Gad. He said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. We talked about already in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 8, how Gad's going to repossess Jordan. God's going to defeat the enemies and give it back to Gad as a possession. Here it is. It's laid out there. Do y'all see this? What is Gad? What do we see? They're going to be attacked first, but then they'll conquer in the last. So we see when the battle of Armageddon takes place and Israel is attacked by their enemies, the line of the tribe of Judah is going to come back. It's in that verse. I just read it to you. The line is going to come back and he's going to defeat all those enemies and they're going to possess the possessions of their enemies. Okay, let's keep on going. Verse 22, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Again, this is the judgment of, okay, Dan means judge. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to judge the nations of the world. Future. You with me? I'm not getting any more. Verse 23, and of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with blessings of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. It's a picture of Israel ruling the land underneath Jesus who is the true king in the kingdom age 
And I think I got one more in verse 24. And of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren and let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass as thy days, so shall thy strength be. So this is the happiness and joy in the kingdom age. But I'm going to tell you this one thing and we're going to be through. That it's also a prophecy, I believe, about where they're going to find oil in the last days. And right now, there is a very, I don't know if he's still doing it, but in recent history, there is a Texas oil man who's in Israel, or was in Israel. I haven't heard nothing about him recently, but Mr. Cardoza said he's still there. But he's a Texas oil man. And you know where he's looking for oil? Right in the foot of Asher. And it says, Asher shall dip his foot in oil, and his shoes will be iron and brass. Sound like a drill bit, doesn't it? And that Texas old man, I mean, I'm talking about things that from years gone by. I don't know where he is right now. But I want to tell you something. That Texas old man believes that in the foot of Asher, there's going to be the greatest oil find the world has ever seen. And it's interesting to me that in Deuteronomy 32, you have that whole chapter is dealing with Simeon. And when Simeon came, he declared the judgment upon the world. And isn't it interesting that Asher is not the last son, but Asher is the one that's mentioned last because it's a picture of the rising of the nation back up. So Anna in an instant comes forth. And there's joy and rejoice and there's happiness. And so that's pretty much... A foundational study, you can take it and go with it. Go through the whole Bible with it. Look up the word Reuben and read every time Reuben's mentioned and you'll see that prophecy laid out in his life. Read the next son, Simeon. You'll have that prophecy laid out all the way through the Bible, all the way from the binding of Simeon in prison by Joseph. Hearing is bound and the Israelites cannot hear today because Jesus spoke in parables. On and on it goes. It's all laid out prophetically. I told you it's vast. Some of you felt like going to sleep, but I love you. God's Word's awesome. I don't care what you think. Go home. Go home. Go home. Go home. But before you do, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would keep your hands upon your church, upon your people as they travel home. Keep them safe. Send your angels forth. We ask, O oh God, before them, watch over them and give them a safe trip back to their house in the name of Jesus. Somebody praise the name of the Lord. Somebody worship Him. Glory to God. Lord Jesus, you're my victory. You're my King. You're my Lord. I honor you. I praise you. I glorify you. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. If we would have said no church tonight because we're worried about the danger, I want to tell you what we'd have done. We'd have sat in our homes and we'd have been depressed and we'd be so empty and so unsatisfied. And about this time, we would have said to ourselves, I wish, no, I wish, I would have liked to have gone to church because this didn't satisfy this didn't fulfill I was so worried and so full of fear that something was going to happen to me but I want to tell you something when I go home tonight I'm going to be able to sleep very good because I have had a move of God in my life and I'm going to leave this place blessed and satisfied entering into the rest of God feeling good about this night because I met with my God tonight so God bless you I love you go home just ask you to pray for my family okay Jesus name